You are now listening to the Meat Pies podcast, your podcast for most things footy and a few things pie. This is Gabe, and we are freaking back, baby. Been kind of in and out, busy times, but we got the whole handsome gang back on the day. Luik, Forrest, Nico, Paul, and we'll talk everything Manchester, Derby, and manager Carousel. But first, boys, how are we doing? Tremendous. Couldn't be better. It's nice to see everyone. I think I'm absolutely jacked up after a uh, scintillating meat pies derby. I didn't even put it in the outline. I'm not going to lie. That was, <laughs> that was something. Yeah, I so loved how I, I, I didn't gave you. I didn't no, no, no. Game, but uh, I, watched the hi- I watched the full match highlights and uh, like quite the stinker. I'd say probably about 45 seconds long. <laughs> wasn't yeah. wasn't um, the last last time they played it was like a the five three FA Cup quarters right something we like played that? since then I think Spurs have beaten oh. us since then I want to say but yeah we did have a, a crazy one we've we've had a few crazy ones the past two years and today honestly could have gotten weird it was a weird one yeah. um wait Paul what were you gonna say sorry I was gonna say best part of the match is uh not even during the match it's when. Delph is named man of the match, and he's like standing there flexing, and it's like <laughs> zero zero. <laughs> he, and you can mention, just tell from the picture, like nothing happened. Don't need to watch that. Yeah, he played sixty minutes and was man of the match <laughs> in a in a nil nil draw. He played sixty minutes in the center of midfield. And then, okay, anyway, he's just That's standing so there. Like... Funny. It's unreal. Uh, we're um if you're if you're not if you're not watching on YouTube. Uh, we're we're in an early, interesting stage of uh, of no shave November right now amongst the pies. I can see, mm-hmm. um, yeah, mine's coming in slow right now. I'm not gonna lie, actually, because I want to go mustache here at some point soon. But the week's rocking it. Force got some work to do, but uh, yeah, the rest of us we're we're looking at now. I'm just kidding. Force is of course dominating us. I mean, and the week honestly. Yeah. But well, Nico, honest- Nico and I are coming back. We're coming back. This is this is just the remnants of my Halloween costume. I dressed up as Super Mario, so the mustache had to be as bushy as possible, as emphasized. Yeah. Um, Next week, I will I will be coming with a full stash. Don't you let's worry. Go. I same see, same. It's it's there, Paul. Uh, wait, Luik, is Super Mario like a code name for a '70s porn star? Honestly, could be. It could be. I wore. Super Overalls, wrong. no shirt, and Doc Martens. So, kind of had that seventies porn star it, look going from. It's me. a little racy that you went as Balotelli for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that would be that such a, a good costume if you had like the Y always the Y always shirt, and you're like, I'm Super Mario. Will you not recognize me? <laughs> Never heard. Of oh, well. um, yeah. I don't think any of us really have the capacity to be uh, going as Balotelli for for Halloween, but. We'll we'll leave that conversation for another day. <laughs> um, or never. We don't need to have that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you all been busy. I've been I've been busy. I've uh, been in, in Glasgow the past couple of days for um, COP twenty six, which has been pretty exciting. Taking my amateur journalistic talents to uh, to the good people at Climate Reality Latin America. That's been a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and I really wanted to quickly shout out because I know I'm not going to have another chance during the pod. There was a talk on Thursday. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was actually I can tell you it was how sport can kick carbon with Sky Sports. Um, and it's on YouTube. It was just a really interesting one for everyone listening. Um, had, had a good panel and a good little video with it. So yeah, maybe I'll, I'll tweet that out from the, uh, the account later and people can check it out really interesting well a lot of spurs talk um because spurs are, are kind of leading, leading the charge in the prem at the moment as we've we've mentioned but um yeah definitely definitely check it out I'll, I'll send a tweet out about it but yeah glasgow great place great place nico was way too ready to make a spurs joke there and yeah, no, I, I held back i held back <laughs> only thing sustainable at the club right now mm. Uh, <laughs> the stadium okay uh we'll we'll get into the the rundown though enough with all the chit chat um it was a pretty interesting match day 11 i'm not gonna lie and it kicked off in manchester at the theater of memes as ole rolled out his patented 
fear inducing wing backed formation. But the only ones in blue who seemed scared on Saturday were the BBC reporters and raincoats who had to interview McFred after the match. Pep kept his special jack up his sleeve, but it proved not the matter as City controlled from start to finish and opened the scoring with a perfect, perfect finish from Eric Bailly for what's looking like an own goal of the season candidate. Just absolutely sublime finish. The second goal just before half put the game to bed and Pep and his squeaks handed Ole another embarrassing home L. The other matchup of Titans this weekend featured a showdown today between Klopp and his freaks squaring off with Moyes' mighty directional meet. The scoring started early with Allison, Liverpool's most prolific goal scorer, looking worse with a punch than Nate Robinson. However, Liverpool recovered the goal deficit before halftime with a free kick routine curled home by Trent that made many a FPL player happy. The second half was poised to be great and it didn't disappoint as Jared Bowen provided a pair of assists, first for Pablo Fornals and then for Kurt Zuma off of a corner that was defended worse than Poland at the end of the 1930s. The forgotten Divac Origi grabbed one back for Liverpool and Mane almost stole a point late at the last, but West Ham held on in the end and bubbles flowed throughout the stadium. So, boys, tables shaping up pretty good. A bunch of other matches happened this weekend, by the way, but yeah, none of them really mattered. Um, but I don't want to say none of them mattered. You know, Chelsea dropping points is important, but those were definitely two best matches. And uh, yeah, the table's shaping up pretty good. But with that win, West Ham actually jumped Liverpool in the table um, into third place. They're right there in that title race. I had written down here is West Ham clearly the fourth best team in the Prem. But I think maybe even more serious than that. Do you think they have, you know, a shot at really making a run at this title? Before we do this, I just want to say we don't accept Nate Robinson slander. On the meat pie spot, okay? Seattle the, legend. The tape Seattle is out there. Legend. We're going to move past that, okay? The, the tape is out there. Um, I think it, in terms of West Ham, like maybe making a title charge, it's probably a little early to say. I think that they might struggle a bit to cope with Europa League um, in their fixtures because I think them more than another team would struggle because – as I heard before the game started, David Moyes has only made four changes in the entire season to their starting lineup. And so I think with an increased fixture list, they could struggle to hold up a little bit. That being said, they are playing like challengers. They're playing like contenders. Um, I'm not sure that they have the, the legs to see it out. But I do think they could have the legs to get a top four finish. Hands raised in the chat. I love to see it. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd echo what Paul's saying there. I think when you look at the actual title contenders, and I mean, we harp on this so much on this podcast, but uh, squad depth, like we don't really see much of West Ham's bench. Paul, you just said it, but I don't even know what their bench really looks like very much. I know they have like, you know, Masuaku who can come in and be good, but like, I don't know. They're, Gabe, you look, you look passionate about this, but I, I just don't think they have that depth um, to really charge ahead. Um, I think they're definitely top four contenders, no doubt. Um, and I'm definitely scared to play them in a few weeks because I know last year our matchup with them was a real thriller. Um, but I don't know. I just look at a squad like Liverpool um, who are facing sort of midfield injury woes and they still had some really deep midfield depth that could kind of carry them. Um, right now, it looks like West Ham still kind of relies on that uh, Suchek Rice anchor and they haven't experienced one of them being out yet. And I honestly only think it's only a matter of time before one of them deals with a knock for a week. And I wonder how that would shape up for them because they are going playing midweek games um, against feisty European sides. Um, so we'll see, but uh, definitely top four contenders, title contender, way too early to say. I think we all see pretty much eye to eye on this one. Um, I was basically going to come in and say everything Luik just said, but um, West Ham are a massively impressive side. And you look at who they've beaten this year, Liverpool, 
Spurs. Not that that's too much of a brag these days, but uh, <laughs> Manchester City, um, Everton, yes, uh, United, and Leicester. Easily. Those are some quality wins, and they play good quality football. And I think that's easy to see. Um, it's they just have to stay healthy. That's really what it comes down to. And I don't think you can put them in the conversation of those top three sides that have all of that depth and all of that quality. Um, but I'd say that they're favored over United right now to play to, to finish top four because David Moyes has them absolutely banging. And um, that, that man deserves a lot of credit for, for what he's done with that team. I will say, I think you all are kind of underestimating their depth. Um, just because I know like today in the chat, I shouted out Ben Johnson, who I really, really like. Um, he's been awesome. But I mean, he ousted in that right back position, Vladimir Sufal, who's been one of the best fullbacks in the Prem for the past few years. Sufal has been healthy and just, you know, starting here and there. If they change formation, um, you know, maybe they'll put him in a wing back. But, but really, Ben Johnson's been starting a lot of matches. But besides that, I mean, Lanzini didn't play today. Um, I think Jop's a pretty good player. Vlasic is out hurt right now. I do agree that if Rice or Suchek gets hurt, I think that's the one big concern. But I think, you know, in defense, they have a decent amount of depth. Going forward, they have a decent amount of depth. Lanzini didn't play today. Um, and and then also, I mean, and, and Ogbonna went out hurt um, in the first 20 minutes today. Craig Dawson came in, did a great job. And then also even keepers, you know, like Ariel is their backup keeper, was really good last year, I thought, for Fulham. Um, so I, I think their depth is a little underrated. And as you said, they've showed their quality so far. We are a, a pretty good chunk in, into the season now. Um, and, and the other thing, the last thing I'll say is that I haven't been, I, you know, City will go on their run. I think at some point they, they just go on these runs of unbeaten. I think that's going to be tough for a lot of teams to catch the way everyone's kind of looking right now. Um, but, but Chelsea is dropping some surprising points as it did this weekend. Liverpool's dropping surprising points every other weekend. Um, so I, I think it could be a really interesting race. Yeah, I'd also add that um, I'm probably a little biased in my assessment of West Ham because it's hard for me to swallow the pill that they're definitely better than Arsenal right now. Um, well, I mean, and they might not be. It's like Arsenal's only, what, three points behind them? No, um, yeah, I mean, we're, especially we're after the fifth start right now. Arsenal yeah. had, like... Yeah, but I guess more what I'm saying, what I'm thinking about is the fact that it only really looks like it's going uphill for West Ham from here. Because when you look at their summer signing, like honestly, signing Kurt Zuma is a big deal. Kurt Zuma is a household name in center backs, um, like has been at Chelsea for a couple of years and, you know, consistent week in, week out starter for a bit. Really, really top quality center back. And also, there's this talk. I don't really know much about it, but um, Rebecca Lowe mentioned it today, or maybe it was Graham, about you know someone wanting to pump billions into West Ham, and if they get tons of money, like it's clear that everyone at West Ham, from the fans to management to the coach, the players, is bought in, um, and it doesn't seem like there's any harm for investors to be pumping money into West Ham at the moment. Um, so it looks like their trajectory is only going uphill. And it's interesting to kind of compare that to the likes of Newcastle where their trajectory is like really going down, but they got so much money to deal with it. So yeah, interesting stuff from them. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I think that'd be a great move if they had, you know, a big, big investment come in. It looks like it's going to happen. And obviously they kind of have that, that check connection, um, the club. So, you know, a couple of really good check players. Uh, yeah, that'd be, it'd be pretty cool. And obviously that stadium, I think could use a little bit of cleaning up. Um, if they really get that stadium, right. It could be an awesome place. But bubbles, Gabe, but bubbles. Bubbles, the bubbles aren't there. going anywhere. Yeah, the bubbles are there to stay. This is completely random, and I'll get back to the West Ham like takeover in a sec. But Gabe, you need to go to a Crystal Palace game because their stadium looks super fun. Yeah, yeah. I was I watching the highlights. I was watching the highlights, and I was like, "Wow, this actually looks like really cool." Um, yeah, Selhurst Park, I think, consistently gets uh, ranked as like one of the more satisfying fan experiences as well um year in year out so definitely it looks tremendous 
back to West Ham for just a bit. Um, yeah, I was hearing rumors about like a potential Czech takeover, which I think I'm kind I of think, 50, 50 Wait, on. sorry. Or is it just is it just like a minority? Yeah, deal? It's, I, th- okay. I think I saw something about like maybe twenty seven percent stake in the club, um, with a potential to maybe down the road invest more. I think that's a really smart move for them because I don't think I think that one of the reasons everyone loves West Ham, not everyone, because like a lot of London teams are like rivals with them, but. I think for neutrals, West Ham is like a very popular club because like you always have people like Mark Noble like playing for the badge and they just have like a little like they just have like that little gritty edge that a lot of teams don't have um, and that makes them a really fun watch. And then on top of that, they're like at the peak of their game right now. Um, And so I think if there was a majority takeover, it might take away from that a little bit. but the fact that it's like a minority stake is, I think, a great move for them. And I think it's going to keep the club like in a similar, like positioned similarly to the fans with just more funds to work with. I could see them using some of that in January, maybe to sign a backup CDM um, to increase their depth a little bit there. I'm not sure why they wouldn't do that. Um, but yeah, I think that would be really cool. I heard some pretty random rumors that Slavia Prague, which is how they got Sufal and Suchek, might become like kind of like a feeder team for them. I think this this new Czech investor might have ties there as well. Um, they also have this so, young Czech kid who came from Slavia Prague, something crawl, who's supposed to be some bright Czech youngster. So yeah, there's that could be cool. No, I think that I I, I think that this is actually a very uh, a very wise move from West Ham. I mean, it, it's rarely an unwise move to accept like billions of dollars, you know? Um, but I, I just think that especially where they are as a club and as a, just a franchise in general and like they're with their connection to the fans, I think that this is going to go over well. Okay, for whatever reason, they put the largest sound system in this building to run this event. I can hear this guy's microphone from like 200 yards away. So hopefully I don't get interrupted too much. It's not going off right now, but I muted myself there for a sec. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll monitor the situation. But um, yeah, do we maybe want to like talk just for a second about Liverpool and then we can, we can move on to the Manchester Derby because this is another kind of uh, you know, disappointing result for Liverpool. I think uh, Klopp didn't seem too... I guess sort of upset at the final whistle. I think he kind of accepted it. It was a great match, but um, but this really is a game that uh, you maybe expect Liverpool to to take more from. And I mean that that back line as much as you know as much as they do have all these injuries, that back line's fully healthy. You know, is one of the most talented back lines in the entire uh, world, and it still has Henderson and Fabinho sitting in front of it. Um, and they looked like they struggled today, honestly. I mean, there was a, a, a span of 10 minutes in the second half where it seemed like every time I looked at the screen, West Ham was breaking through the lines. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, you know, Liverpool seems like some weeks they're, they're the best team to ever touch a field and other weeks, um, you know, they look more like this. And I, I can't really put my finger on, on why. I feel like Liverpool's biggest struggle today in my eyes was breaking down West Ham. And I think that I was, I was a little annoyed because like in the immediate commentary, like everyone's jumping on their injuries in midfield. I'm like, okay, they still have a great midfield. Like they had Fabinho Henderson and they were playing Alex Oxley Chamberlain, who's a fine player. They could have played Thiago there. Like that's a really good midfield. I'm not really having it with the whole injury bollocks. Um, I also think Van Dyke was good today. Like, he makes stuff look so easy. And there were a lot of times defensively where he made really important challenges. It wasn't a perfect performance by any means, but I think he cleaned up a lot for them today. Um, but I think mainly, maybe just credit to West Ham, maybe Liverpool just couldn't find it. Maybe they were missing Firmino, honestly. I think he provides a lot of depth to their front line. That I think he's really good at like breaking layers in defense, right? Because he can come gather the ball and he can pull players out of position really well. Um, and I think maybe they, they missed that a little bit today because that's something that they really needed against Ham, where Rice and Suchek 
sit so well in the middle and pick up people. If you can pull Declan Rice way out of position, there's going to be a massive hole there. And that's where like Mane and Salah kind of thrive and then finding the spaces in behind. Um, Cause that that's, especially in the first half, I was Liverpool had a lot of the ball, but they didn't have any like crazy good missed chances. Their, their best missed chance was the Mane missed header at the very end of the game. Right. Um, uh, yeah, so the more I think about it, the more I think they might have been missing Firmino today. Um, I wonder what he would have looked like in there because I feel like Jota plays a very different role. Um, Luis, why, why do you think Liverpool might have just struggled that extra step today? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. One, to kind of piggyback off what you said about Declan Rice. Um, I think, yes they maybe should have altered – I mean, they definitely should have altered their system to try and break out, break between Rice and Suchek, but Declan Rice is so good at covering ground. And, like, they were talking about this in the first half, and I didn't notice it until Arlo mentioned it, but, like, he's sitting back picking up Jada, and then when Jada, when Jada drops back, he passes him on to Kurt, and he just runs straight at Henderson and covers so much ground and forces Henda to play back. And um, I, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's Declan Rice being like a world-class player, right? Um, another thing though, is I'd say Liverpool were honestly just outmanaged. Um, the first half definitely was a pretty damn balanced match. And it was pretty obvious that, I don't know, West Ham was gonna be kind of stalwarty in the back. Um, and Liverpool never really tried to change their game plan. They still wanted to get it to the wings, try and get Robbo and uh, Trent to whip balls in, but that back line's big for West Ham. Like, they're tall, and they were packing numbers in. Rice and Suchek were sitting in front, letting literally no through balls through. I mean, Thiago could play a pass and break a line, but no one can turn no one was also everyone was being tracked really well so no one could be there for Mane or Salah as like a layoff option and even if there was a layoff option it was so crowded anytime there was a shot getting hit it was just like there were three players in front of it that were going to block it and the more numbers you have there to block the less likely you're going to get a deflection into a goal right so um I think Liverpool is just like a little bit outmanaged. Um, I also think just these last two games are Liverpool getting a little bit complacent. Um, I think there's all this talk about Mo being the best in the world, which right now he just definitely is. But um, I don't know. It seems like there's a little bit of an over-reliance. And I don't know. These things happen, right? Like form is form. It's not permanent. I, I don't think this is really going to be something that they need to worry about. Brighton is a good squad. Like we know that. And West Ham is a fantastic squad. So those are two really tough games. Um, also, Gabe, you said it in the chat, but I don't know why Divock Origi doesn't play more. Um, his goal was sick. So I mean, they have Firmino and Jota. So and I know, he- but. I know he's always getting injured, like always. Yeah. And even, even with those like big guys in West Ham's back line, you know, Jada still got his head on a few balls. He's, yeah. he's incredible. But I mean, um, I guess like a shout out definitely has to go to Aaron Cresswell as well. I mean, on that left side, that's an incredibly tough matchup for, you know, a 31 year old uh, fullback. And yeah. Salah really didn't have, was not able to create the space today that he's, you know, been able to create for weeks on end, it seems like. Um, and same with Trent. So, and also I, I do have to say, the two goals conceded or two of the three goals conceded today for Liverpool were set pieces. Um, but that is to say also Liverpool has not looked, have not looked very good in defending set pieces this year. And that, you know, if that can't get sorted out then that can easily prevent a team from winning a title, um, they struggled with a physical Brentford team. So, and Van Dyke isn't exactly, uh, you know, a, a dominant in the air type of center back, um you know obviously he's he's really good in the air but they just haven't really been dominant in the air it seems like so i don't know we'll we'll have to see um either way title races is looking great and uh a couple of teams that expected to be in the midst of this title race this year played each other this weekend 
One of them is in the midst of this title race, Manchester City. Meanwhile, their crosstown rivals, Manchester United, not so much. Um, but I mean, like, what what did we really expect to happen? Right? Is it like is this not exactly what we expected to happen this weekend? Sorry, Paul, but precisely. Yeah, I feel like when I was, I watched the highlights and. I think, Gabe, I don't remember if we talked about it that much, but I kind of thought it would be close. I thought United would just kind of get hyped up for the rivalry. And I put, I, I swapped Ronaldo in for Harry Kane in my FPL team, guaranteeing that he would bag a goal because it's a big game. But then I watched the highlights and I was like, yeah, I mean, City is just like a lot better. Like I should have kind of, known that like they could potentially win very comfortably at home so i don't know how do we feel about these new uh three in the back formations that united have been trying they it's, still it's felt it's just <laughs> running, out of, running out of options and just trying anything to get anything going or um yeah i think so exactly like a good foundation behind it Save i don't game. know man it did not look good this weekend <laughs> like it this weekend, Ole was just like so incredibly outmatched. He doesn't even have to be like again going up against Pep to be tactically outmatched. And the fact that like this result, this performance feels as bad, if not worse, than the Liverpool performance in my mind. Like there was literally just nothing happening. He sat in this formation for too long. He switched at halftime, bless his soul. But um, the players just didn't really know what they were doing. They were so flat across the back. There was no depth at all, which made Bruno probably ran like 50 kilometers that game, like just like sprinting all over the place, getting dragged way out of position. And the commentators kind of were ragging on him for it. They were like, oh, like, what's he doing? Not pressuring there. Like, he just doesn't care. He just doesn't care enough. And I'm like, He's like so far out of position already. And you want him to basically be playing right back when we have five defenders on the field. Like it, they just didn't know what they were doing. I think it worked once for Ole and he's like, okay, like we got, we got to do this. And it just didn't city. were just so much better in every single position. Um, honestly, De Gea saved us so many times again, like he had a monster performance his form is one of the only things like keeping us afloat this season. Um, I feel embarrassed for saying that Dean Henderson should have kind of taken a number one spot because last year he was kind of iffy, but oh my God, he's been so, but this is what he does. He's like amazing and amazing. And then he makes a terrible mistake. I don't think the second goal was his mistake. I think like, you know how Trent today was just like completely med like bewitched watching that cross come in just, letting uh who was it, zuma or diop or someone get on the end of it um that was like luke shaw and harry Maguire in the derby like literally just like ooh, like watching the cross like bounce in the box in front of both of them and then it goes past them and you're like yeah what did you think was going to happen you're both just letting it fall in the box and it just feels like stuff like that where it's like i you know that these players are better than this like there's a reason that the, like they can't get it out of themselves. They don't feel motivated to like fight for the game. It, they feel like they can kind of just get, I don't know, just get the game taken to them. And then they're like, okay, well, I guess this one's done with. Um, yeah. That's kind of all over the place, but it just does feel like Ole. It's just so obvious that he's out of his depth and it's hurting us every single week. That being said, the players deserve some responsibility. Luke, I'll let you go after this. But the players do deserve some responsibility for their performance. Like, they are playing really poorly, like making mistakes that aren't on the manager. Um, but it's just the whole environment at the club right now seems very passive. Um, so, no yeah. tactics, just vibes. And speaking of no tactics, just vibes, one thing I noticed in this game – I mean, definitely the best player on the pitch all game was Joao Cancelo. Um, and Fire. 
Yeah, he's, he's unreal. Um, I think they were saying he has the most uh, dangerous passes of anyone in the Prem right now, something like that. Um, and it's making me realize that I don't, I don't know if like Pep is the one who pioneered this necessarily, or if it's like he had the personnel to do this and then other teams kind of started doing this. But I don't know if clubs have really figured out how to defend or press against the inverted wing back or the inverted right back or left back yet. Because when Liverpool are really good, that's what Trent is doing, right? He's coming in kind of playing that D mid slash right back. Jao Cancelo can do that on either side. Um, and you know, they, they have like that position kind of leaves so much ground covered and also so much ground to advance into. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's just like no one in the world better at doing that than Jao Cancelo. Like that ball he played in um, for that second goal was unreal. Um, so that was one of my thoughts. With United, I was just like, it is just, it is so clear that the players don't even want to play for each other right like and I think that was a big thing and kind of on my own little like soapbox for a sec makes me think a lot about this uh most recent England squad call up like if I were Gareth Southgate I would not call up Harry Maguire I'm sorry he's terrible right now I don't care if he's been captain before he's just bad at the moment and he's clearly not playing for anyone besides himself Luke Shaw not playing for anyone besides himself um and I'm also like, I, the reason I say this is my soapbox because I'm kind of butthurt Ben White didn't get the call up. Um, but yeah, so th- those were my, those are my thoughts. Fair enough. Um, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, there's been a lot of managerial changes in the Premier League um, recently, and we'll get to that in just a minute or two. But uh, I actually cannot believe that Ole has outlasted all these other managers so far this season. Um, it's, it's it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Like it's just it also just comes down to like um, I, I saw something on Twitter today that was saying Ed Woodward leaves in like three weeks or something, um, and he probably doesn't want to make his last contribution like sacking the manager. Um, so there's still so many ownership issues at United. It just feels like there's like a poisonous cloud like sitting over the club. And it's like the owners are like, we don't like them. And they're kind of like running this club more as a business than a football club. And then the manager has no idea what he's doing. He's so technically out of his depth. He is not getting anything out of the players who also are underperforming even from their own standards. Like, it's just literally, at, it feels like at every level, like everyone is failing. It's honestly a miracle we're in fifth and we have as many points that we do. The only reason we do is because we have Ronaldo low key. Like he just saves us sometimes and we get the, we can like spend a bunch of money on players. So like, there's a lot of talent in the field, which saves us at times, but it literally just feels like every single tier of the club is like toxic. Yeah, um, looking at their Champions League campaign so far this year without Ronaldo and De Gea making a couple of worldies, they they have like maybe one point in that group. Yeah, and I mean, I know like the highlights that I get over here are a little different than the NBC highlights, not quite as long, but um, I unfortunately didn't have a, a chance to watch the, the full match on Saturday. Kind of happy I didn't, but... I mean, I didn't even see a single chance that United made in the highlights. Um, yeah, I was, I was at the, the big march in, in Glasgow. Uh, no big deal. It's pretty fire though. But uh, with Greta Thunberg. But uh, <laughs> but I didn't see a single chance they made all match in the highlights. Um, I there was see one good save. Yeah, I see 0.73 like XG here on the stats. I don't know where that came from. Don't know where that came there from. There was that one Ronaldo volley yeah. that was kind of wet, but oh, in action. That but was, it is, that was yeah, Great that was, shot. yeah. I mean, the, it is crazy. Like, 
I guess I'm realizing like I didn't really watch much of Ronaldo over the last two years because I never really watched Serie A. Um, and all this talk about like Ronaldo making teams worse, like never really came to me. And I, I don't think he makes teams worse. Don't don't get me wrong. But um, it's just interesting watching how it's it's clear Ronaldo plays for himself and it's almost like infectious to the rest of the team. Right. It's almost like he's at a certain level that's so much higher than everyone else that everyone just wants to be at that level, but not necessarily in the right way, if that makes sense. I'm not really sure I agree with you because I don't think you can like quantify anything that you're saying. I, I don't think I can either. Right. That's why I'm like, I, I'm like very hesitant to say it, but it is just interesting. Like, there's just no cohesion in the team, right? And I don't know. There was definitely some cohesion last year, right? I'm not going to attribute it all to Ronaldo, obviously, but it is just like he's a very prominent figure. He's like a very loud, prominent figure on the squad. He's saved your asses so many times this year. Yeah, just feels weird. I I, I think it feels weird because, like, there's no there's nothing for anybody including him to buy into like we were just saying at West Ham like everyone's so bought into what they're doing it makes them like twice as good there's nothing for any of them to buy into and he is an elite player and he's like an elite winner so he's like I'm not just gonna like not buy into anything so he's like I'm just gonna bet on myself three times as hard I'm gonna take everything I can and it saves us sometimes you might see other players kind of attract to that mentality, which actually probably isn't the best thing for us, but it's arguably better than nothing, right? And I think that's one of the reasons that Ronaldo is kind of having this effect that he's having is like he he is like the manager's focal point. And so because there's no other tactical depth happening anywhere on the field, it, it all kind of falls on him. And I think you you can easily mis mis misdrew. I don't know if that's a word. You can easily mistake that for him, like dragging everything towards himself and being selfish, right? Um, there might be a little of that too, but I I think I think it it goes both ways. It's overstated for sure. Christian FC. Well, uh, actually, Ron Doggo FC. Christian is my new name for Cristiano. I mentioned that we'll we'll get into some uh, some manager carousel talk, and I think this is this is the time to do so. Um, it's been a crazy few weeks of of movement in the Premier League in terms of managers coming in and out. Um, obviously, big news that we kind of just missed out on last week was was Spurs' appointment of uh, Conte and sacking of Nuno after just uh, four months in charge. Um, and we can we can talk about that a bit before we get into the the Villa sacking today of Dean Smith and Norwich of Daniel Farka and yeah lots of movement everywhere. Um, but I guess we start with with Spurs and and maybe just I, I mean uh, did, do you all consider yourselves lucky that you lost El Sacico and yeah. ultimately like fell into Conte? I um, mean I mean I, I don't think that United would have appointed Conte anyways to be honest. Um, I mean maybe they would have but. Uh, it seemed like kind of perfect timing, the perfect transition from uh, kind of an awkward Nuno phase. And and I, I'm guessing you all are feeling pretty positive about this move. First of all, I think you meant to say that we won El Sacchio. Um, but El yeah, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of different layers to uh, deconstruct here. But first and foremost, we got a top class manager coming in and um, I think the biggest difference is what you see from the players. Harry Kane came out and said how excited he was to play under Conte, which is a massive 180 from where he's been with the club for the past several months. Um, so that was lovely to see. Always love that. Sonny had some great words saying how excited he is to improve under Conte. But um, yeah, I think, you know, the new no experiment obviously failed. Levy played the safe option. It didn't work. Um, Conte said that he wasn't quite emotionally ready to take on a new job after the summer. Who knows? If that's really the reason why he didn't um, initially sign that contract back in July. But um, yeah, you know, 
I think uh, my my one frustration in regards to the whole situation is you had Levy and you had Partici talk about how um, they wanted to get a manager in who's going to play attractive, um, free-flowing, attacking football. That was like the number one priority. The number two priority was get a manager who's going to play young players and who's going to develop the young talent that they have in the squad. I don't think that this hire does that for Spurs, but um, I think we had a taste of what rebuilding looked like and hated it so much that... um, yeah, I think uh, we're going for we're going for a quick fix on this one, and hopefully it gets the players a little bit more inspired. But overall, very very thrilled. Conte, top class manager. I think it, they did it. I will give them credit. I think they did it at a very very good time. They did it early enough to where the season's salvageable. They can still contend for a top four finish if Conte is able to turn this squad around. So, props to the men in charge for for making this difficult call. Um, I think it was uh, really not that difficult in the end, though. Yeah, I think regarding the thing you said, Nico, about um, like playing attractive, free-flowing football and playing young players, I don't know. I don't want to say that Levy and Partici realized they need to scrap that, but it's more like the mentality and like the culture of the team was so bad that that kind of needs to be fixed first and prioritized like we you and I maligned like how poorly we looked how little like the squad seemed to care week in and week out so I think that's kind of why they made this move so quick is they realized like they can't have the whole team infected with this like bad attitude um so that's why I'm really excited I sent that athletic profile last night about Conte and it really addressed like the pros and cons of his style. Like I'm interested to see how the January window goes. Cause I feel like he only really has two years before his like really, really aggressive, hard pushing personality will wear on everybody. And he'll probably leave like he has at his previous jobs. Um, but he's also been really, really successful in those short spans in those jobs too. So I'm excited that like it seems he'll be giving everyone kind of a kick in the ass and I guess we'll see who like wants to be there too like I feel like there are a couple players who just aren't going to respond well to it and they'll be probably quickly discarded um but yeah yeah. I, I think he's pretty much exactly what they need in regards to fixing the culture um you I think you're bang on or spot on right there but um what he's going to do is he's going to get, he's going to force out all of the players that don't have what it takes. And I think that's massive. And I think it's going to be like, yes, he might win us a trophy. Maybe he's a serial winner. It's what he does. But um, I think it's going to be a good reset in many ways. Definitely. I wanted to say you were talking about like the rebuilding experiment under Nuno. And I think that you guys have kind of hit, Uh, like you're at a very different place of the club that I think you thought you would be like maybe when you hired Nuno I think did Nuno was he the manager for the summer window so or did he come like right is that like when they couldn't get a manager for like the longest time yeah Yeah, I mean they brought him in and like they basically started doing all their transfer business right like immediately after but the all the transfers were 100% part teaching um and, and yeah, but but anyways, they like they probably assumed you guys were losing Harry Kane, and then they're like, okay, well let's we have to like start something new here. And I think you guys have hit a point where you're like, okay, we have a very similar, if not a better squad than we did last year. Like Romero's like, I still think like it will be an amazing signing for you guys. I think that the the whole idea of like we need to completely rebuild just might not be super necessary. I think you have enough talent that like you don't need a full rebuild right now. I think you can achieve relative success with where you're at. And I think, like you said, I think this is a good time for Conte because like he's not going to be like there for a decade, right? He's not going to be there for a super long time. He's going to like do his best to get the most out of what you have right now. 
Um, and then maybe you can like, hopefully he can, the ideal situation is he brings in a little youth and he wins, right? Um, that, that, that's a good we'll, shout. We'll sure. see what, we'll see what happens on the youth side. Cause that's also important for depth. Um, but I just think like, I just think, I don't think you guys need a rebuild right now. I think that maybe in like a year and a half, we can rediscuss this, but um, I think that Conte was, congrats on the win on Osaka Coats, top class for you guys. Huge. Louis. World, world beaters. <laughs> yeah, I, regarding the rebuild, also like, I don't think y'all have the money to do a rebuild um, for a bit at least. So like this definitely seems you like- You said really- y'all are broke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just smells know, like I a just, whole bunch of broke in here. <laughs> <laughs> I just know since like the stadium was built, the the Spurs finances are kind of in the shitter. Pardon my French, but um, what I was also gonna say though is, oh yeah, I I'm kind of curious, like if you all think, because I mean, okay, obviously did incredibly with Chelsea. And then also tank them for a period. But um, when he was doing really well with Chelsea, was it 2017 they won the league? No. 20, he got them, he did really well with them. He was there between 2016 and 2018. Um, 2018 was the year that they were really, really, I think they were down in seventh at one point. Um, and then they sacked him. But I wonder how much you all think the Prem landscape has changed since he's been a coach in the Prem. And if that is going to affect the way he's going to be able to have success, pardon my meat. Nice. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I wonder if that's going to affect the way he's able to manage Spurs and like find success with Spurs in the prem. Because I mean, the teams are just, every team is just so much stronger now. Right. Well, I think, sorry, this doesn't answer your question directly, but I think even besides that, this team, I know you said there's some talent in this team. Watching that full 90 minutes today against Everton, this team is not nearly as talented as the past three teams he's managed. I'm mean, not even close. I mean, it literally brought in Matt Doherty today, Matt Doherty today to play out of position. To play out of position. Like, that's crazy. And he started Ben Davies. Like, so, I mean... <sighs> It's that that's the one thing that I wonder about is how does he actually manage a team and be so hard on a team that is lacking the talent of Inter for the past couple of seasons of Chelsea of a few seasons ago of the Italian national team from Juve. five years ago Juve. of Juventus. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, he hasn't really had a project like this in a while. And yes, the league is a lot different than when he was managing Chelsea. Those teams played a style that, you know, league winning teams don't really i mean i guess maybe it's a little bit comparable to like current liverpool um a little bit but but it's still it's just uh, you're right it's a little bit of a new game um so i don't know it'll be interesting to see i I know we could talk about conte for a while but do you mind if i kind of move this on to uh i I was just really really shocked at the dean smith uh news today um he he was given a tough job at villa even though you know he had a lot of talent in that team, it was, they were 15th in the championship, um, brought them up to the Premier League and uh, and has had, you know, a, a tough time in the Premier League, has done well staying up um, in that first season. And there's been clear progression, had a decent start to the year. I mean, obviously, there's readjustment with Grealish leaving and, and new players coming in with that money. Um, but it, it just felt like a really uh, sort of I mean, there, you know, Every club, there might be things that go on in the background that we don't know about, but it did seem like a really brash decision today from the club to to let go of him. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious who comes into that job. It's an interesting job, but do you all have any feelings about that sacking in particular? Jack Grealish was pretty vocal about it on Twitter, actually. Um, he was just saying, oh, like... I haven't seen that. He was just saying, like, oh, no manager will ever connect with the fans like he did. Just like a lot of praise for how he was as like a man and a manager. Um, I saw he, I think he tweeted himself and then I saw some tweets he liked as well, which it's, it's really cool. He actually really is still connected with a lot of the Villa fan base, which seems cool. Um, 
Let me look at where they are on the table really quick. Well, they've they've struggled the past few games, and yeah, sorry, really quickly, just on that note of how much like he connects with the fans and the players. Also, just like a real meaty manager, um, mm-hmm. and it's it's a sad day for us meat pies because we're kind of losing um, one of the kind of the the few remaining meaty managers in in the league. Um, yeah. You know, maybe maybe Conte is a little meaty coming in, but <laughs> but Dean Dean Smith is like truly meaty, um, and between. You know, in in a span of a, a couple of weeks, leaving losing him and Steve Bruce is is really tough for for the meat um, in the league. Yeah, it's cool. it's a tough day for meat boys. It, it's John just, Dyche's shoulders are getting really sore. <laughs> <laughs> like John, Matt, but he's got big shoulders. The big shoulders. Like... Yeah, I mean, honestly, it, it just feels so premature because I think back to our season last season. And at this point, we were, I'm pretty sure Arsenal was sitting in 15th after this many games. We were on like a seven game losing streak and we were about to come up against Chelsea in December. Like we were bad. And obviously there were like like calls for Arteta out. I was a strong advocate for that at that point. Um, but to think about like what a manager like Ole has survived with the resources he has, what a manager like Arteta has survived with the resources he has. It's so weird to me that they would sack Dean Smith at this point, given that he brought in a lot of really great players. Maybe they're not clicking quite yet, but it's still so early in the season. Yes. Like we're maybe a quarter way through or something, or I don't know, but it is still, um, it's just kind of sad. I don't know. I feel like they gave into the peer pressure of the fans or gave into the peer pressure of the, the league's revolving door of managers. 100%. And I really quickly, this is not to bash Graham Potter, but I saw a tweet that really surprised me yesterday, and I meant to send it to you all in the chat. Um, but I feel like Graham Potter is consistently talked about as sort of like the cream of the crop of, of English managers right now, um, sort of coming up in the league. But this tweet says, since the start of 2017-18 season, Brighton have spent just shy of 300 mil on players, and they finished 15th, 17th, 15th, and 16th. That, that's, that's pretty crazy how I think Potter is consistently talked about the guy when it's English managers, but there are guys out there like Dean Smith who are getting less investment, less of a leash. Um, so yeah, I, I do agree. I think it's kind of a, a sad day. I'm curious to see what Villa does. Um, interesting team with interesting momentum, good history, um, some talented players. So we'll see. But yeah, I think we all feel it was kind of premature. Really quickly as well, um, the Farke sacking, like, like what, like why? Clearly, they knew they were going to sack him before the match if he won his first match of the season and they sack him afterwards against a good <laughs> Brentford team. Like, that also is, is insane to me. I just don't understand, like, what is going on in the league right now. I mean, the man's been awful for 10 weeks in a row. Gets his first win and you sack him. I, just, I mean, Norwich is a joke, honestly. They're a joke. I don't know why they'd sack him at all. It seems like their first, like, legit result this season and they had guys out for that game too um not playing billy gilmore for whatever reason that's a joke in of itself todd cantwell was out um they brought in brandon williams again and then they actually get a result against brentford tim cruel was making a lot of saves in that game um and then their manager goes right after it just doesn't make sense i feel like they really just want to break the spell of like the best championship side the worst premier league side and they feel like they just have to make a change regardless in order to break that. I don't know if that's the right decision. It's really hard for me to tell. I don't watch enough Norwich to say, like, what is the big problem there? Um, I just feel like it's really – I feel like there are a lot of manager shift-ups that are coming. Like, not that it's unexpected that Farco would go. I think it's, it's, it's okay that he's getting sacked, but, like, the timing is weird. Same with Dean Smith. Like, the timing feels really weird. I don't know. Maybe there's something going around the league that we don't know. I'd be surprised if that was Something going around the what? The league. The weed? (laughs) Get off the The weed. No. I Um, I mean, I think the Farke sacking was probably overdue, if we're being honest. Um, I mean, if anyone deserved to be sacked the way the team started the season, it was probably him. I mean, they were absolutely brutal. 
Um, but yeah, the timing just strange, just strange. Also, this is not about a manager sacking, but like I'm just looking at the table and the Wolves are in eighth after they like didn't score a goal for like their first four games or something. That's incredible. Bro, the X the XG does not lie. The XG does not lie. Because they were XG mm-hmm. Kings for this first couple of games yeah. as well. Um they've Quang been really good at does not lie. I mean, they had a tough result yesterday against Palace, um, but I don't. It sounds like they didn't really play that poorly. Um, also, Palace is is kind of in really really good form at the moment. But Wolves dominated us last Monday. Also, kind of a short week for them playing Monday and then, uh, and then I think they played yesterday. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they they dominated us. Um, good good team. Great league. Love it. Um, also, wait. Speaking of Graham Potter, Gabe, I'm just looking it up right now. And Brighton, over the last five se- seasons, has spent 202 million pounds. Yeah, which is in the top half of the league for the last five seasons. Yeah, and I'm not even sure what their best finish is. I mean, they're they're 15th. doing really well right now. Yeah, 15th. They're in seventh right now, which is fine. But like with all of that spending, you would expect them to finish in the top half for sure. Yeah. Um, and then there's this narrative that like they have nothing to work with, right? Um, yeah. It's like the narrative is like Graham Potter pulls them out of the dirt and they have nothing to work with. But when you look at the numbers, like it kind of seems like they're buying a lot and they're just not performing still. I think the thing with Brighton and Graham Potter is, you know, you, you look at that team, just that club, and you expect them to not play attractive football and to just be mediocre to a middling, poor Premier League side. But he actually has them playing quality attractive football which is why he gets the praise he does um and you know last year they had a poor finish but i don't know if you guys remember but the narrative around last year was they were just getting massively unlucky and losing all of these close squeeze it out type games that um they normally that they probably should have gotten a point or three points from so um i hope they have a better finish this year because um, i think it's deserved We will see. We will see. Um, yeah. And then finally, like the last thing with mention with managers, we mentioned Steve Bruce uh, out at, at Newcastle, but it sounds like Eddie Howe is the man for the job. Um, interesting appointment. I think a lot of us were expecting a bigger, more established name. Obviously, um, Howe's done, done a really good job in Bournemouth. But um, yeah, I mean, that's this is going to be a much much different task than than Bournemouth expectations are going to be a lot different um and an English appointment which I'm not sure all of us were expecting either so should be uh an interesting one I'm really curious to see what he does with this current squad if they can stay up um because they are in a lot of danger right now tied with Norwich on points actually which is crazy um so on with five uh yeah not not great so very curious to see what happens, but I think it is time to move into our meat man, our meat man, our meaty man of the week. And uh, Forrest, you can take it away. Thank you. Uh, this week's meaty man of the week is going to Crystal Palace's James MacArthur. John McGinn, a.k.a. the meatball himself, meaty Scottish midfield partner, Um, has been anchoring the Eagles all season with tough performances in the center of the park. The Eagles are on a great run of results and manager Patrick Vieira knows a thing or two about being an absolute hunk in the middle of the pitch, has been singing the praises of the bearded Scott. Although he kicked the absolute crap out of our favorite spicy Saka a few weeks ago, MacArthur has seen many ups and downs in his time at Crystal Palace, and he deserves the rewards for I'm staying thick and meaty through it all. Cheers, James. This one's for you. You guys actually see that kick? Yeah, yeah. that's bad. That was, was how was that not a red card? Keep <laughs> the leg. <laughs> we disavow. Shout, shout out to you, James. I'll say shout out to Forrest as well for being meaty and empowering through some of my typos there as well. Consistent um, meat. Every week it's like it's an adventure at times. <laughs> <laughs> I've got good chemistry with you typos. Oh yeah, they're they're in there. Uh, for when well, it's it's a rotating squad of, of writers we got on the meeting man as well. We're like SNL, uh, except for well, I guess we're equally crap as SNL these days. Um, well, 
I, uh, I am sad to report that we're about to enter another international break. Like what the actual heck? Hate so it, I hate it. Um, literally like we're just getting rolling and then it's boom, international break again. Um, but like the one maybe saving grace of this international break is we finally get another U S Mexico, um, rematch. And I was thinking, I saw I was being played in Cincinnati and I was like, why in the, like Cincinnati just, I understand Ohio has got some good fans, like Columbus crew. They got some good fans. Um, but like, why are like Cincinnati is not a, a great American footballing city. Why are we putting these matches there? And then I realized not a whole lot of Mexicans in, in Cincinnati. Um, so, yeah. The US took outlaws, know how they got sold, how they got showed up at the Gold Cup. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Next one is in Fargo, North Dakota. <laughs> Just gonna put put the game in uh, in Alaska, in Juneau, Alaska. <laughs> yeah. Shout out Juneau, Alaska. By the way, my parents say it's beautiful. Oh yeah, great. It's never, Juneau. never been. Speaking of top, <laughs> speaking of top tier uh, footballing, American great footballing cities, uh, Juneau, Alaska. Yeah, so American Outlaws will be in full force. Um, I'm excited for that. Do we have any like maybe predictions for for that? Is it a qual? What's it a qualifier for? Is it just friendly? It's it's, it's World Cup qualifiers. Okay. Like we're entering mm-hmm. the last rounds of of WC qualifications, so it's important. Like in, I think Pulisic now he's healthy will play. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're America is looking healthier than we've been in a while. I think Gio is still hurt and recovering. Um, Mako, I think, is, is looking pretty healthy at the moment as well. So it'll be some full squads. Happy in the squad, yeah. I think so. Yeah, actually, the squads were released. He I, is. I kind of yeah. forgot to take like a, a day or two ago. I saw just him. ask Wade. Yeah, our guy, our resident peppy expert. Mexico is up three points on the U.S. in the final round of qualifying. I'm just looking at the table right now. Um, so th- we would be tied on points if we won this game, we being the USA. Um, could be a good match. I'm going to say Mexico is going to win because I'm actually kind of a USA hater. Yeah, I'm saying. I think it's going to be like a 2-1. Some cheese refereeing, though, guaranteed. <laughs> oh, always. That's automatic. <laughs> venture yeah yeah i mean i think there also has been a lot of uh turnover in our squads for these qualifications so um I- i'm i'm curious to see how pulisic fits back in um yeah but aronson's been on fire for for rbs um as of late uh tim has been getting tim timothy way has been getting a lot of starts um for liel they're playing pretty well uh, West looks really good, guys. First goal for Juventus recently. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it'll be it'll be an interesting match. And I'm not sure if, if Abusio's in the squad. I'm not sure if he started uh, in in Venezia's upset over over Roma um, today. But I think it was over. Yeah, it was over Roma. Um, but yeah, you know, decent uh, decent couple of squads should be should be a great one. But not thrilled about this international break timing. But it is what it is. Busio did start, by the way, and played all ninety minutes. Nice. Yeah, definitely, definitely a curse. This this international break. I just know it. Our our ten game unbeaten run is gonna get screwed over by a game at Liverpool after an international break. So, yeah, not happy. These what did these? Well, quickly, um, maybe we'll just jump in. I mean, all I, I just want to say, I'm just blowing it when it comes to FPL, like. Just absolutely blowing it. I was so excited when I saw Harvey Barnes on the score sheet today. Like, just I'm one of the last remaining Harvey Barnes truthers out there in the FPL world. Um, and then to check my lineup and see that he just wasn't in my squad. He's just sitting in my subs. And like the one week where literally everyone in my starting lineup actually decided to be healthy. Um, yeah. So was not particularly excited about that was also cursed by the Sanchez red card in the Brighton match. Um, I'm, I'm just losing ground here on, on Paul and Nico. Yeah, Nico, if you feel like making one transfer over budget, I would, it wouldn't hurt my feelings this week. In my lesson, really, I haven't made a transfer in like four weeks. Actually, that's Dude, you not, know what? I just, you know I just what? Did it this week, but like I didn't make <laughs> it in four weeks and then I brought I it. wish they added up. I wish they added up. I feel like, I think they only add up to two. And then if you don't make one again, it just doesn't 
recycle anymore free yeah. transfers. Yeah, exactly. Um, I thought, oh, I didn't know that. I was going to accumulate a couple there, but then it was it maxes out at two. Yeah, um, which I guess makes sense. Yeah, I think we. I think a lot of us lost points. Maybe not a lot of us. Maybe just me and Gabe lost points on that Sanchez red. Dude, I knew I was making a mistake not starting the cycling GK. He's going in my lineup next week. He's like, who do they have? Oh. One sec. And Pickford had a great clean sheet as well left him on my bench. I did not realize uh, it didn't go up past two subs because I was so rattled a couple of weeks ago. I could have sworn I was supposed to have three subs and I just got in my own head and I was like, or, or three transfers, I mean. And I, I got in my own head and was like, maybe you only had one last week and now you just have two. But I definitely had two and I was holding on to have three so I can make like a big move. And then it just never went up to three and I was rattled. So, dude, I'm I'm definitely big brain. I brought in Gallagher for this game week, eleven points. Yeah, I brought in Cancelo, all... fourteen. Mm. Um, my team's looking all right. I think I might. I think I'm gonna maybe change it up just a bit and get like a real like get Ramsdale, um, because he could provide some good differential. Who's Arsenal's fixture list? Eh, it's not great. Yeah, we got we'll, see, we'll see. I might just start Ben Foster. I'm kind of I kind of don't care about goals and being honest. I think I lose points by not having like a goalkeeper like Mendy or like Allison or something like that in net or Ramsdale. Yeah. But to be honest, like I feel like the differential with goalies is so small. I'd just rather keep it cheap. Dude, having yeah. Mendy in there is fucking great, I will say. Yeah, Mendy was such a good buy. I used my wild card this week. And yeah. how'd that go? Yeah, Luke was mad he couldn't just like ditch if anyone's wanting. <laughs> Luke's yeah. like, why isn't my team not saving? And he's like five mil over budget. And he's like, I thought that didn't matter. Did we, if the budget didn't, didn't matter, how'd you only go five over? How'd you not go like 20 over? <laughs> yeah, it's like you play your wild card oh, no. first. I wasn't you just thinking. get the best Shut players up. on the game. You use the wild card just so you could bring in like Ivan Tony and like <laughs> Aaron Cresswell. <laughs> he literally did bring in Aaron Cresswell. No, I I brought in <laughs> no, I brought in Aaron Cresswell for my bench, and I brought in Mo. Exposed, exposed. <laughs> I brought in Mo. Oh. I brought in Gabrielle, and I brought in uh, Rafinha and Norgard and Fang. So Rafinha is good. Rafinha is a good. I yeah, Rafinha I is going to be a good buy. I think Mo is obviously cheat code in this. Um, so, it's bringing in anyone named uh, named Gabrielle to your team mm. always sounds always like a, a good plus. idea. Yeah. Dude, I swear every time I bring in Vardy, he just like lays an egg. <laughs> like I brought, I I had him to start, and he would just lay in complete eggs, and I left him out, and he went on a crazy tear, and I brought him back in eggs again. I'm not yeah. good with the strikers. I've never gotten like a ton of points from a striker, actually. Dude, the striker position is actually pretty difficult to get ready. Yeah, it is. I was riding the Antonio way for a long time, but like the options really aren't that great because it, it like it pretty much classifies forwards as like strikers, and there aren't that many quality strikers. Yeah, and choose. like Mo, that are, Mo's that are a, that are a midfielder. Mo's a midfielder. Mane's a midfielder. Uh, Jata's a midfielder. Like all those guys are midfielders. Mane. Um, like, yeah, so many guys are midfielders. I got a, I got cheese today though by the, um, the Larice like Richarlison decision too. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys have checked that out yet, but I saw it. I saw it. Okay, but to blow it dead while we had the open net, yeah. and then to give the ball to Spurs. Oh, I didn't like I didn't what know. weird. It was that was wild. It also, was there was wild. no, there was no touch on the ball. Yeah, there was. He got yeah, the. It was, it was. Oh my god! But if you're calling that a touch on the ball, that is was, that was, was such was a close. Okay, I was. I was. I was, I was, was play, but I it was close. Won. It was. It, it could. I think the penalty call could have gone either way. I, I wasn't. I wasn't particularly mad that it got overturned. What I was really mad at, about was that we had a wide open net, which Harlison actually, for the first time in his life didn't roll around on the ground and got and played the ball quickly and had it still at his feet with the open net. We had guys in the box and the play got blown dead and Spurs got given the ball after the play was reviewed. Like it was just ridiculous. It was ridiculous. If he didn't call a foul, like there would have been no review, right? 
No, you can go. People go back and review penalties all the time. That yeah, um, that might have happened. Yeah, he definitely the passed up the mechanics. Yeah. Well, because really I'm thinking, so I didn't see the play. So did Richie get taken down, like semi, like questionably, it was okay or not? And then did he get up and score? And he called the foul. And because he called the foul, they had to overturn the foul. So Spurs get the ball. He didn't score. It's just like what happened was, uh, but yes. Yeah. I mean, like he got taken down, but he got up quickly and still had the ball. And he was kind of like, like Larice was kind of like standing in front of him, like out towards the edge of the box. Um, and Richie had the ball at his feet, kind of looking up like to see what his options were. And then the play got blown for the penalty. And so everything stopped and Richie was like kind of celebrating. And then they barred it out. And then the ball was given to Spurs. It was ridiculous. Get, it was ridiculous. get barred. Highlights, Paul. You should watch our wingbacks also kind of choke two really good chances. Too. Yeah, it was it was not the best. Anyway, speaking of Paul. I haven't heard, I haven't uh, heard a good review of those highlights, so I might have to pass. <laughs> the Everton Spurs uh, November 7th, 2021 highlights have a 63 on Rotten Tomatoes right now. <laughs> um yeah sorry anyways uh paul you uh you have the final media bite today and uh it's your turn to stand and deliver yeah since i'm an fpl beast yet again i get to do this um i was thinking about monologuing about united but i feel like recently it's whenever we talk about united we're just like saying how shite they are so i'm gonna i'm gonna let that one die a little bit um Again, like I said earlier, like the city loss felt almost as bad as the 5 0. Um, but as I was watching West Ham today, it, it just shows the gap between West Ham and like a lot of teams in the league, especially us. Um, their shape is amazing and consistent. Their discipline's great. Um, like we've all mentioned, like you can tell they're really bought in. And I think myself and a lot of people I think our teams like aspire to play like West Ham like it's a very admirable style of football that we all love to watch um hopefully maybe under a new manager we can pick it up and create some consistent patterns like they do I think that would be amazing um just to end the pod here and just to end the West Ham talk I think one of the reasons they're so capable of playing like they do is Declan Rice I think I saw an interview with David Moyes recently and he was saying like a hundred million for rice is like a bargain now like he's proving himself I don't know how true that is a hundred million is a lot of money but he's proving himself to be by far and away the best English midfielder in the world top five defensive mids in the world um like true defensive mids not like box to box mids um I was never a huge fan of him in the past I kind of thought he was slow I kind of thought he just didn't really have it the same way. I thought he was next to Suchek, who was really good. But now I think like Suchek's next to him, which is really good. I think he made Calvin Phillips. I know Gabe is a huge Calvin Phillips fan. I think he made Calvin Phillips look really good in the England team. Um, And I think he does that with whichever team he's playing for and whoever he's playing with. I just think he makes them look really good because he's so, so solid. so I just want to end the pod saying he's just the best defensive bid by a country mile. Um, what a player he is. So shout out Deckers. I know you're listening out there. Shout out. Seems like a, a top guy as well. Um, and he only turns he only turns 23 in January. Um, so crazy. can't can't wait to watch him for a long time to come. Well, thank you for that. Paulinho, and thank you for listening to the Meat Pies podcast. Um, if you liked what you heard, please subscribe or follow wherever you're listening to us. Feel free to leave us a review if you're on Apple Pod. Just make sure it's a good one, or else I'll send Big Dunk out to find you. I actually saw recently we're uh we got some nice looking reviews on Apple Podcasts. Yeah, we're we're so if so if you're out there and you freaking mess up our rating on Apple Podcasts, I'm not. Yeah. Um, he's gonna, anyways, he's gonna, gonna send big dunk. He's gonna. I'm send gonna. Big I'm dunk. just gonna send. One, I guess it's just gonna happen. It's just gonna happen. Um, you can find the Meat Pies podcast just about anywhere you get your podcast. New episodes just like this one being released every single Monday. So make sure to stay on the lookout. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok at Meat Pies Pod, YouTube. See the stashes for November. Enjoy the rest of your week. And as always, up the pies. Up the pies. Up the pies. pies. pies.
of the past. Forrest, this is for you, baby. <laughs>